Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going live. Hey, Hold on to your butts. Okay. Go ahead. All right. We are live. We are live. We are live. Welcome to the Disciples of Yahweh in Christ. Uh, pull in. Uh, pull up a chair. Come in and sit down. Make sure your seat backs and tray tables are in their full and upright position. It is time to take off today with Sam Shmoon. Hello, Sam. Hey, boy. How are you guys? Just making sure I'm at your YouTube channel. So oh, okay. To see yeah. how is. So what I do is usually I go to the channel itself to see. And uh, just to let everyone know, because we're using Zoom. In Zoom, you have about a 20-second delay, approximately. I haven't timed it exactly. So when he says something, I say something, it takes about 20 seconds. But it's great to be here, and it's an honor to serve with you guys. I pray the Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of the Almighty Father, the Father's heart who became flesh, fill every one of us by his Holy Spirit, because we all need the Holy Spirit, not just to do ministry, but we need the Holy Spirit to love Jesus Christ the way he deserves to be loved, to obey Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, resist Satan, overcome our flesh, crucify our flesh, and be filled with the fruit and the life and the power and the wisdom and knowledge from the Holy Spirit of the living God to become more like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to love Jesus Christ more passionately, obey him more perfectly, and glorify him more completely. So, Lord Jesus, increase in us. Lord Jesus, purify us, our loved ones, my daughters, in your holy blood. And Lord Jesus, save us from Satan, our own sinfulness, to never shame you or betray you or deny or disown or blaspheme your name, but to love you even unto death and take over the session and convict Muslims and strengthen your church for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So good to be Amen. with you guys. And I'm excited to talk about Islam. And then if the Lord's spirit would have it as he guides this conversation, we can also talk about women in Islam. So. Nice to see, and I pray God will prosper your ministry, brethren. You guys well, there? Thank you. Uh, amen. Yes. And, uh, also, don't don't forget to subscribe, <laughs> like, and share, and also Please. go to Sam Shimon's uh, channel as well because he's a very very knowledgeable person in the scriptures. So, also go to his channel and subscribe and yep. And, and pray uh, for me that I can walk the walk to be a doer of the word, because our Lord Jesus did say to us. He who loves me will keep my word. He who does not love me will not obey my word. That's John 14, 23, 24. So we want to be doers of the word. And the Lord Jesus save us from our own sinfulness. But I'm hoping by the grace of God, your ministry takes off. And the Lord bless you two brothers and keep you on this path of being men of integrity who love Jesus Christ. So, Amen. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, the channel name is Disciples of YHWH in Christ for anyone that don't already know. And Amen. just subscribe and I, Sam, I was just curious. Yes, sir. When uh, when you I've heard you talk uh, some, and I've heard other speakers talk on how women is treated in Islam. Could you tell us about that? Uh, do you, do you first know what Islam means? Uh, it means submission. Submission to who? Uh, submission to Allah or God. Then who is Allah, brother? According to them, uh, it's uh, God. It's so, yeah, that's what I'm, my point is. Before you jump into about women Islam, you need to educate your audience what Islam is and what they believe. And I'm sure you've done that. You've brought other people. But sometimes we bring in speakers who already assume that the audience are familiar with the tenets of Islam and what they believe. So <clears throat> we don't want to assume that because you may have new people coming, new faces. It's always important to do the best of our ability to accurately represent another position, what they believe, though we disagree with it. So before I talk about women in Islam, what is Islam? Why Islam? Why Islam? What is Islam? You said submission. So if I define the term Islam as submission or surrender, and <clears throat> theologically means to submit or surrender to Allah, and according to the Quran, Allah simply the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, those who do not speak Arabic may not be familiar with the name, the term Allah, because the Quran is written in Arabic. I just want to educate the non-Muslims, especially those non-Muslims who don't know much about Islam. I want to help them by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ so they can know a little more about Islam and their neighbors. 
the word Allah, Arabic term, may sound foreign to non-Arab ears, but that's <clears throat> similar to reading the Old Testament in Hebrew and discovering that the word for God in Hebrew is not God, it's Elohim, or Il. I say Il so because I don't want to sound like I'm saying the letter L, right? El, but Il, Eloah, Elohim. So for a non-Arab, Allah, Allah may sound like a foreign word referring to a foreign God, but to Arabic-speaking Jews and Christians who read the Arabic Bible, Allah is the term used to describe the God of the Bible. For example, Jody, have you read Genesis 1-1 in Arabic yeah. when it says, uh, in the beginning, who created the heavens and the earth? Uh, no, I haven't read it in, in uh, Hebrew. Yeah, no, so that's in Hebrew. In Arabic, what does it say? Uh, uh, no, I, I haven't read it in Arabic either. Yeah, in Hebrew, as our brother here, Scott, will tell you, he confirms because he's got the sources. He's got it online. It's Elohim. It says, you know, Barashit, Bara Elohim. I'm not trying to impress you with the Hebrew, but it's in the beginning, Elohim created. However, the Arabic Bible says, in the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. John 1 1, written in Greek. It's written in Greek primarily. It would say, in the beginning was the word, and arche and hologos, right? And I don't need to speak Greek. I'm not trying to impress anybody. I really don't. I'm not. But I just want people to understand you're reading an English translation of documents written in another language. The Old Testament, prim primarily written in Hebrew, parts of it in Aramaic. There are parts in Ezra that are Aramaic, and Daniel. Chapters 2 all the way to 7, Aramaic. That entire section is in Aramaic. And if you got a good Bible translation, it will actually indicate to you when you get to Daniel chapter 2, it says, from here on, it's in Aramaic, right? <clears throat> and there are actually certain verses that are in Aramaic. For example, many people don't know that Jeremiah 10, 11, that's not in Hebrew. Everything preceding and after is in Hebrew, but Jeremiah 10, 11 is in Aramaic. And our brother Scott I don't know. I don't know if ESV will give you a note, but there are certain versions of the Bible in English that actually will have a note indicating this is in Aramaic. Psalm 2, verse 12, where it says, kiss the sun. If you go looking for a Hebrew <clears throat> for the term, then it doesn't say kiss the sun. That presupposes that that part of Psalm 2, 12 is written in Aramaic. Nashku bar. Because the word bar is the Aramaic word for sun. In Hebrew, the word sun is not bar, it's ben. So to get kiss the sun, you must assume this part of the psalm is written in Aramaic. Now, why do I keep emphasizing this? Because in Hebrew, you have Elohim for God. You have Eloah for God. You have Il for God. Elim, the plural form of Il for God. In Greek, it would be Theos, Theos. Now, when it's translated in Arabic, John 1, 1 in Arabic, it's in the beginning was the word. The word was with Allah, and the word was Allah. Hebrews 1, 8, where it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. There it says in Arabic, the translation in Arabic, it's your throne, Ya Allah. So why am I hammering this? We need to make sure that the audience that comes to any channel are fully familiar with what the issues are so they can more effect, effectually, effectively, efficaciously minister to the Muslims or any other group by presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ clearly in a way that will make sense to them. So with that said, that in the background, by the way, Brother Scott, I don't know if you're looking up. Were you able to confirm what I said about Psalm 2.12 and Jeremiah 10.11? Uh, I, I'm familiar with Jeremiah 10, 11 being in Aramaic. Um, the gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. That's uh, that's what I'm familiar with. But I wasn't aware of the Psalm 2 one, so that's yeah. cool. No, I, 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 I haven't looked that's it up why, either. That's why there's a debate. They go, if you go with the Hebrew, uh, they'll say, do homage in purity. They try to find a meaning for the word bor in Hebrew that would relate to purity. Whereas if you look for the Aramaic underlying the phrase, nashku bar means kiss the sun, bar, because you and I both know, and our brother Jody knows, the Hebrew term for sun is ben. That's why in Psalm 2-7, when it says, you are my son, 
the Hebrew there is not bar. It's Beni, my son, Ben, my Ben. Right? Just confirming before I move on. Because we got yeah. a lot to cover. And if you guys are right, I don't mind you know, taking my time unpacking it. But I'm at your service. I got nothing but time. Let me just put that up on the screen so people can see it. Here is uh, Psalm 2. Uh, the reign of the Lord's anointed. And as uh, Sam was saying, when over here, when it says, you are my son, now down at the bottom, it shows you the Hebrew. Oh, let, me, uh, let me do this. As he said, Beni, Ben for son in Hebrew. But if we go down to verse 12, kiss the son, now it's Bar. Yep. Aramaic for son. See? Did not know that. There is yep. no footnote here. In this ESP, what so you have a letter before verse twelve, brother. Uh, that says, okay, what does the K signify? I, I don't know what you're using. Oh, there's a cross references in the ESV. All right, yeah. Now, is it typical for authors inspired by the Holy Spirit writing in Hebrew to then <clears throat> include Aramaic wording in a predominantly Hebrew chapter? Yes, because in Psalm 31, verse two. If you read the Psalm, I'm sorry, Proverbs 31, my apologies. Too many references. Remember, may the Holy Spirit grant us perfect recall of the facts in Scripture, interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ. We trust the Holy Spirit to sanctify us fully. If you go to Proverbs 31, verse 2, there it says, Bari, my, my son, and the Hebrew word is Bar. And yet it's predominantly, the, it's the Aramaic word Bar, Bari, my son, the son of my womb, Bar. That's Aramaic in a predominantly Hebrew chapter. So, yes, it is not uncommon to find in the Old Testament and certain books where the chapter is predominantly written in Hebrew, that then they interject Aramaic phrases in a predominantly Hebrew text. So in Proverbs 31, that's predominantly in Hebrew, but when referring to the son of her womb or her son, if you look at it, it's the Aramaic word bar, not ben. Can you confirm that? Because I go by memory. At times, I want you to fact check me because I'm not perfect. I'm the closest thing to infallibility next to Jody. All right. Here's Proverbs 31. And in verse 2, what are you doing, my son? Again, it is bar. See? And over here, bar. And over here, uh, bar. See? And yet everything before and after is in Hebrew, right? Yeah, I assume so. I mean, I haven't checked every word, but you know what I was, I was thinking of um, when, you, when you were uh, describing this, we have loan words in, in our language as well that we sometimes use in place of, um, you know, English words. Yeah. I might say, Jody's my amiga. Everybody knows that's a Spanish word for friend. So we do it too. It's, it's nothing unusual. Yep. And why I say that, because in the Aramaic portions of Daniel, when it speaks of God, the word is Allah. And they even use the plural form for Allah, Allahin. For example, my brother, if you open up, and this is going to tie in with Islam. I, I know some people say, where is he going with this? He's going on 10. No, no. There's a method to my madness as we yield to the Holy Spirit to sanctify us. Honestly, we need the Holy Spirit, not just to know how to teach, but to live for the glory of Jesus and love the Lord as he deserves to be loved by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Daniel, for example, if you go to Daniel 3, and if you read Daniel 3, 25, 26, brother, there you're going to see that when Nebuchadnezzar describes the fourth man, he says, and the fourth man, the one who appeared as a man, looks like, and it says, son, bar alahin, and it's the plural of the word Allah. That's Aramaic, bar alahin, the bar alahin. And then in 26, it talks about Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego being the servants of Allah, God Most High. Now, Allah, you see that, brother? It's right there. Mm -hmm. You see the word? You confirmed it. Right? Servants of, right, the Most High God, Allah. Yeah, right. And then if you Allah. look at in 25, it's Allahin, plural. The in is the plural Aramaic suffix. There it is, Allahin. Yeah. Yep. So Alahin would be the Aramaic <clears throat> cognate for Elohim. Singular of Alahin is Allah. When it says Allah, that makes it definite. So what's my point? Even the way I'm pronouncing the word, because I speak Syriac, which is an offshoot of Aramaic. Allah, Allah. So someone speaking 
a Semitic language because Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic are Semitic languages. They're cognate languages. They're sister languages. So for an Assyrian to hear Allah, that's not foreign to his or her ears because they say Allah, Allah had to make it definite. Now, why did I take so much time to unpack this? Because as Christians who are engaging Muslims, we must be aware that the Quran written in Arabic speaks of Allah as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, that doesn't mean I believe that claim, but as I'm trying to explain to Christians, as they are seeking to pray for Muslims and pray for their salvation and love them to Christ, because unfortunately online, we tend to attract what I call the sewage of these religions, the, the people that are nasty and vile and blasphemous and wicked. That's not majority of Muslims. So I just want to put it in perspective. Online, you're going to track the dregs, the sewage, the, the really wicked, vile, blasphemous tools of the devil who will come and mock God, blaspheme Jesus, attack the Bible, slander you, and try to pervert scripture. That's the nature of doing ministry online. When you meet them face-to-face -face, out there in, quote-unquote, not the virtual world, but in the, quote-unquote, real world, majority of Muslims do not know their religion. Majority of Muslims do not know much about Islam. Majority of Muslims don't even know what the Quran teaches. Majority of Muslims are some of the sweetest, most hospital, hospitable, most loving people you meet. And I'm not just saying it to say it. I'm being honest. I live in their midst. And if you don't believe me, go to an area that's predominantly Muslim, interact with them. You will find them to be hospitable, loving, gracious, and kind. Right? So I want you to keep that in mind. I don't want you to demonize Muslims or see them as other, because if you do that, you won't reach them with the gospel. You won't love them enough to pray for their salvation because you're going to see them as the other, as a threat. Most of them are not this way. In fact, <clears throat> which is going to segue into our discussion about women, many of them are victims of Islam. They are victims of Allah and Muhammad. They are victims of this system. They are living under an oppressive system. You'll find children, especially young girls and women who are abused because of this system. They are not your enemies. They're the ones who are taken victims by this false religion ideology and need your love, your prayers, that Jesus will shine his light of love and bring them out of that darkness into the light of his love. Because Jesus is alive, he's almighty, and he loves Muslims. So keep that in mind. Now, with that said, Islam, I just want to real quickly define what Islam is. Real quickly, we'll talk about women. But it's important for the non-Muslims to know. The Quran does claim that Allah of the Quran is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It makes that claim. In fact, it makes it mandatory. It makes it an article of faith that professing Muslims must affirm all the biblical prophets, even those that are not named. Because in the Quran, it mentions many of the biblical figures. It mentions Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it has a lot to say about Jesus and his blessed mother and his followers, even though this is not the real Jesus, it's not the real God, it's not the real prophets, because in my understanding, the Quran is a satanic counterfeit. It is a religion, a book, a system inspired by Satan to present another Jesus, a different spirit and a different gospel, which Paul, the blessed servant of our Lord, warned us is what the serpent would do to seduce us of our spiritual virginity. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 of 4, and verses 13 and 15. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 of 4, and verses 13 and 15, Paul warns the Corinthians, you are a spiritual chaste virgin betrothed to a spiritual husband who's going to marry you spiritually. It's not physical, it's not sexual. But I fear that as the serpent seduced Eve, he will seduce you from your devotion to Jesus. How? How will Satan do that? How will serpent guile try to deceive you? For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. So this is how the serpent robs Christians of their spiritual purity and virginity and devotion. By presenting another Jesus and you tolerating it or accepting it or following that 
other Jesus or receiving a different spirit from the true spirit that indwells believers or embracing a different gospel. And this perfectly describes Islam and Mormonism and Joe's witnesses and all other ideologies that posit a Jesus other than the Jesus of the New Testament, who is the Jesus of history. And then what does Satan do? If you want to read brother for me, 13 and 15. Same chapter, verse 13 and 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. All the way to 15, brother. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Now, notice the old adage, do not judge a book by its cover. And here you have Paul pretty much saying the same thing. What, what do I mean? Satan is smart and he's cunning. He's not going to come as the prince of darkness. He will appear as an angel to disarm you and deceive you into thinking that he is an emissary of God preaching the truth. He then enables, energizes, empowers his servants to appear as ministers of righteousness. So his servants won't come out and tell you, commit sexual immorality, murder, steal, cheat. And lie. No, because Satan knows that most human beings, because they bear the image of God and have God's moral law written in their hearts, are repulsed at such <clears throat> practices. So what does he do? He will energize someone to appear spiritual, to appear pious, to appear humble, to, to appear <clears throat> self-controlled, to appear loving and compassion, feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, builds orphanages, institutions in the name of his or her God. Because this is Satan's master plan in deceiving you into trusting such people. What does that mean? Don't judge a book by its cover. Oftentimes, and I'm a perfect illustration of that, and I, true, I, I pray I'm a true servant of the Lord Jesus in spite of my imperfections. Many Christians are harsh. Many Christians are hard to get along with. Many Christians can rub you the wrong way. And I know I'm guilty of all of the above. But here Paul is saying that doesn't mean that individual is not a servant of the Lord Jesus. It means that he's a damaged vessel, a work in progress whom the Holy Spirit is healing. But don't necessarily assume that if you meet someone who's humble and self-effacing, or contrite, or <clears throat> just spiritual, you know, devoted to intense fasting and prayer and, and charity, that proves that he or she is of God, because that may be a satanic facade. So then how do you know someone is a true servant? What are they preaching? Who is Jesus? What spirit are they presenting? What's the gospel? That's how you know a true Spirit-filled emissary of God. Not the way they dress, the, the way they look, the way they eat, the way they speak. You know, that, that can be a facade. What it is, is what Jesus are they proclaiming to you? What God are they worshiping? What gospel message are they sharing? So with that said, you can have pious Muslims. But it doesn't mean Islam is pious or spiritual or of God. No, it's a satanic facade. So with that said, let's go into real quickly break down some of the articles of faith of Islam. Islam uh, Sam, I wanted to make a comment before you move on, because that, this is such an important part. And we talked about point this. Uh, uh, we spoke about this before with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they're good people. They're striving to know God. Uh, you know, like you say, uh, all the Muslims I've met are, are nice people. The Mormons are <laughs> extremely nice and yes. friendly and welcoming. And yes, but they've been taken captive by the enemy to do his will. And they're part of a stronghold. I mean, their, their system that they're in is a stronghold of the enemy. And it says in 2 Corinthians 10, we destroy strongholds. Uh, we tear down strongholds, not by weapons of, you know, war, physical material weapons, but by the sword of the spirit. So that is what we're about. We're attacking these strongholds, not the people. You, ma you made a very important point there, not to hate the people. We destroy arguments, not people. 
And arguments are part of that stronghold. So this is such an important point that the scripture makes as well. And we have to remember that always and show the love of Christ, even to our enemies. It says, if an enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink and you'll heap burning coals on his head. This is how we, we deal with, even with the servants of the enemy, as you say, we, you know, we love them into the kingdom, but, we, you know, we don't also, we don't, um, we don't ignore their wickedness and say, no, that what you're doing is okay. Yeah, we, we can be harsh against that, but make a distinction between the system and the people. So thank you for that. Yeah, so, and again, don't fall for fake piety. They make appear as being humble or pious, but that's Satan's facade to deceive you and disarm you. No, if they have a different Jesus, they need salvation. Don't put up with it. That's what Paul was afraid. Well, you probably will tolerate because you say, oh, they're such nice piece of people. These Mormons are wonderful. So let's just get along. They say Jesus it doesn't. No, mm -hmm. no, because their Jesus is Lucifer's older brother. That's mm -hmm. not the real Jesus. That's not my Jesus. So with that in mind, let me really give you a quick rundown of what Muslims are taught to believe. So then we can talk about some of the more weightier issues and show this is an oppressive satanic system. Once you've been ensnared to the system. Then the facade dissipates and you see the real face of Islam and you see the real being behind Islam. Once you embrace the system and are enslaved by it, you will then truly understand the wicked spirit that produces religion. But until you do, Satan will come appearing as an angel and in energizing his servants to be pious, humble, contrite agents of righteousness. Now, in Islam, <clears throat> you can't be a true Muslim without believing that the God of the Bible is a true God, that the God of Abraham is a true God, <clears throat> and in all the biblical prophets. Let me just read some verses to show you what Muslims are commanded to say and affirm and testify to. Chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 136. I'm reading from two versions, Pikthal and Halali Khan. Here I'll be reading Pikthal, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 136. Say... O Muslims, we believe in Allah and that which is revealed unto us and that which was revealed to Abraham. Notice the figures, Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and that which Moses and Jesus received and that which the prophets received from the Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and unto him we have surrendered. So did you catch it? Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, tribes, that's the 12 tribes, Moses and Jesus all mentioned here. We believe in all of them. We don't distinguish between any of them. They're all messengers, prophets of Allah, who's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Chapter 2, verse 285. I'll read a few. I'm reading in Pictal. He has his own version up. Chapter two, Actually, uh, this is Pictal that uh, we're looking oh, you got at. It? Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, well, chapter 2, verse 285. Oh, you said 285? Yeah, chapter 2, same chapter, 285. I'll read as you get there. They'll can see it. The messenger, meaning supposedly Muhammad, believe in that which, uh, which hath been revealed unto him from his Lord, which is supposedly the Quran. And so do believers, meaning other Muslims must also believe in the Quran. And yet each one believeth in Allah. Every one of them must believe in Allah and his angels and his scriptures. Notice plural, kutub, right? It's plural, not kitab, scripture. And his messengers, rasul. His apostles. Now, the word messenger in Arabic can also be rendered as apostle. We make no distinction between any of his messengers. And they say, we hear and we obey. Grant us thy forgiveness, our Lord, unto thee is the journey. So notice, they have to believe in all the angels, all the scriptures that Allah sent down, all the messengers, along with Muhammad and the Quran, his scripture. Now, a couple of more, and we'll go into the, the heart of the issue. Chapter 3, verse 64 of the Quran. Chapter 3, Surat Ali Imran, the family of Imran, which, by the way, for those of you who don't know, it's called the chapter of the family of Imran. Imran, Ali Imran, Ali Imran, the family of Imran. Now, why is it called the chapter of Imran? Let me explain it for the non-Muslims. According to the Quran, Mary, the mother of our Lord, her father was Imran. So Jesus' maternal grandfather was Imran. And this is stated in chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 33 to 36, where it says, Allah preferred the family of Imran above all create, created beings 
because it's the family of Imran that includes Mary and Jesus, her son. So Mary is said to be the daughter of Imran in chapter 66, verse 12. You don't need to turn there, brother. You can just stay in chapter 3. But in chapter 66, verse 12, Surat Al-Tahrim, 66, verse 12, Mary is said to be the daughter of Imran. Her mother is the wife of Imran. That's chapter 3, verse 35. So this is why the chapter, the third chapter, is named after the family of Iran, because it's talking about Jesus's family line. It's talking about his maternal grandfather. Because in the Quran, for those non-Muslims, they're not aware of this, in the Quran, the greatest woman that Allah created and the only woman mentioned by name, the greatest woman that Allah created and the only woman mentioned by name, no other woman's mentioned by name, Women are identified by their affiliation. The wife of Ibrahim or the mother of Moses. The only woman mentioned by name in Tarek Quran is Jesus' mother. And he's called son of Mary, Ibn Maryam. Arabic is Ibn Maryam. And she's said to be the greatest woman Allah created. In fact, brother, if you can go, if you're in chapter 3, read verse 42 for us. What does the Quran say about Jesus' mother? Chapter 3, verse 42. And when the angel said, O Mary, lo, Allah hath chosen thee and made thee pure and hath pre preferred thee above all the women of creation. There you go. He's purified her and she's been preferred. So this tells you that the Quran makes it mandatory for Muslims to believe in many of the biblical prophets and to honor the mother of our Lord as the greatest woman that Allah created. So un understand the assumption. If Allah created Maryam, Mary, Jesus' mother, and Allah is commanding Muslims to believe and affirm in the prophethood, inspiration given to Abraham, <clears throat> Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, and Moses. That means the Quran is saying that Allah is the God of the Bible. Simple as that. So the, the Quran is teaching that this is the same God. So I think you get the idea of what they're supposed to believe, that their God and your God is one and the same. And that's why I want to read 364, and I'm worried two more. And we'll go into the meat of the matter. 364. Say, O people of the scripture. Now, for people who don't know the phraseology of the Quran, because there's a lot of Christians who don't know. There are a lot of Christians who don't even know their own Bible, let alone the Quran. People of the scripture, the Arabic phraseology is Ahl al Kitab, meaning people of the book. What does this expression mean and imply? Well, the Quran recognizes. That Allah sent down scriptures, inspired books before the Quran. And these scriptures were given to the Jews and Christians. So by way of acknowledging that the Jews and Christians are two communities who are recipients of the grace of Allah and receiving scriptures, they're called people of the scripture. You people of the scripture, meaning you whom Allah gave scriptures to. And we'll talk about some of those scriptures. What were some of the scriptures that Allah sent down to the Jews and Christians before Muhammad and the Quran? Anyway, this is speaking to the Jews and Christians. So it's telling the Jews and Christians the following. Say, O people of the scripture, come to an agreement between us and you that we shall worship none but Allah. So let us agree. We're just going to worship Allah. Let's agree to that, Jews and Christians. Agree with the Muslims. And that we shall ascribe no partner unto him. And that none of us shall take others for lords besides Allah. And if they turn away, then say, bear witness that we are they who have surrendered. Now, the word here means submission, Muslim. Bear witness we are Muslims. That's why Hilali Khan says, bear witness that we are Muslims. All right. Now, one more. 2946. I'm going to read 2946 because this is a question I'm going to raise for Christians to ponder on. 2946. And argue not, this is now telling the Muslims how to engage Jews and Christians, 2946. Argue not with the people of the scripture, Ahl al-Kitab, unless it be in a way that is better. Save with such of them as do wrong. In other words, you only argue with the wrongdoers. But if they're not wrongdoers, they're not harassing you, they're not <clears throat> insulting Muhammad, don't argue with them. Deal with them gently. Speak to them gently. Don't be harsh with them, right? And say, say, then this is what you're supposed to say. We believe, 
the Muslims are supposed to tell us, we believe in that which has been revealed unto us and revealed unto you. See, not only does the Quran reveal to us, but you were given scriptures revealed unto you. Our God, our Ilah, and your God, Ilah in Arabic, this is now the generic noun for God, Ilah, is one, and unto him we surrender, and unto him we've submitted as Muslims. So again, the Islam teaches that Allah of the Quran is the God of the Bible. All the prophets taught the same message of submission, including Jesus, whom the Muslims recognize as born of a virgin. Let me real quickly run down what they believe about Jesus. Jesus, born of a virgin, Mary conceived and gave birth to Jesus as a virgin by the Spirit of Allah, causing her to conceive miraculously, no sexual intercourse. Mary's the greatest woman Allah ever created, the only woman mentioned by name. The Quran says Jesus, whose Arabic name or the name given to him in the Quran is Isa, is the Messiah, al Messiah, the Messiah. In fact, brothers, I say that. Open up chapter 3, verse 45, if you can. He's the Messiah. He's said to be the word from Allah. He's the word from Allah given to Mary, a spirit from him. He was a miracle worker. He did a lot of miracles. We'll look at some of them. And 345, what does it say, brother, if you want to read? And remember when the angel said, O Mary, lo, Allah gives thee glad tidings of a word from him, whose name is the Messiah Jesus, son of Mary, illustrious in the world and the hereafter, and one of those brought near unto Allah. So notice, he is the Messiah. He's the son of Mary. He is one of those brought near to Allah. He's actually said to be sinless in chapter 19, verse 19 of the Quran, which we won't look at. So he's the word of Allah. In another passage, he's a spirit from Allah. He's the Messiah. Now, this should show you some of the miracles the Quran attributes to him. In chapter 3, verse 49. Chapter 3, verse 49. What does it say there? And I'll, I'll read out loud as you show them on the screen. Chapter 3, verse 29, Pictho. Here's what it says Jesus did during his earthly ministry. And will make him a messenger unto the children of Israel, saying, Lo, I come unto you with a sign from your Lord, a miracle from your Lord. Lo, I create fashion. The verb actually means create, literally. I fashion for you out of clay the likeness of a bird, and I breathe into it, blow into it, and it is a bird by Allah's leave. So here the Quran attributes a miracle not found in the canonical Gospels. Jesus would fashion, create from clay, fashion from clay, the shape, the form of a bird. Then he would blow into it, its soul, its spirit, and the bird would come to life. He would animate that clay bird, animate it, bringing it to life, making it a living bird by blowing the spirit into it. So Jesus here is creator and life giver. And Allah gave him permission to do that. That's one miracle, but it's not found in our canonical gospels. Then it says, I heal him who was born blind. Well, we agree with that. That's in the canonical gospels. And the leper, and I raise the dead, all of which we find in the canonical gospels. By Allah's leave, meaning the permission of Allah. Allah authorized me, permitted me to do these miracles. And I announce unto you what ye eat and what you store up in your houses. Now, this is a miracle we don't find in the canonical gospels. You don't find anywhere in the canonical gospels where Jesus would tell people, hey, this is what you got hidden in your house. In this exact area of your home, in this exact location, or hey, this is what your mother's cooking for dinner. We don't find that. The Quran says it's one of his miracles. Lo, herein verily is a portent sign for you if you are to be believers. So Jesus is a miracle worker. In fact, the miracles attributed to Jesus are not attributed to Muhammad. The Quran says Muhammad did no miracles, right? And then in cases of other prophets, though some miracles are ascribed to them. No prophet is said to raise the dead in the Quran. Now, in the Old Testament, you have Elisha and Elijah praying over the bodies of dead boys, and through their prayer, God reviving them. Okay, But in the Quran, no prophets raise the dead, no prophets fashion objects from clay and blew the spirit into those clay objects, animating them, bringing them to life. No prophets cleansed lepers or gave sight to the blind in the Quran. These miracles are ascribed uniquely to Jesus. Now, the Quran does say Jesus was not killed nor crucified in a very vague, ambiguous verse, chapter 4, verse 157. So I'm going to wrap up what it says about Jesus so we can go into the meat of the matter. 
In chapter 4, verse 157, brother, if you want to read it for us, go ahead. And because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him, but, appear, but it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They slew him not for certain. Okay, now notice it says, <clears throat> it so appeared unto them. Pickthaw gave you that basic notion of it that this is how it appeared to them. It appeared so unto them that they had actually killed him, even though they didn't kill nor crucify him. Now, interestingly, I think in your list, you have Sahih International, right? Can you see how uh, that occurred then? Yeah, I just turned it off. <laughs> but I'll put it back. Okay. No, but the reason why I, I, I want the non-Muslims to understand that the majority predominant interpretation of this passage by Sunni and Shia, the largest sect of Islam, by the way, just like Christianity and Judaism, Islam is not monolithic. It has various branches of Islam, some more orthodox, some more heterodox. The largest branch of Islam is Sunni Islam. They, they represent about 85% of the Muslim population. The second largest are the Shia. Now, in Sunni Islam, you have various <clears throat> leaves let's say sunni islam is a branch and you got various leaves shia islam is another branch various leaves some more orthodox some more heretical now you see how sahih international renders it it says but another was made to resemble him to them now just and I'm, again i know i'm preaching to the choir with jody who I'm about to put to sleep and scott and others but remember you're gonna have people who don't know much about islam and they may be scandalized to hear this the majority predominant interpretation of this passage which we read in chapter 4, verse 157. And interestingly, Jody, the name of the chapter is the chapter of the woman. Surat <laughs> al-Nisa, the chapter of the woman. That's the name of the chapter because it talks about women relations and marriage and divorce and etc. Now, the majority predominant interpretation is that when the Jews wanted to kill Jesus, Allah made another person, another human being, look identical to Jesus from head to toe. And they killed that lookalike thinking they killed Jesus. This is why in Sai International it says, but another was made to resemble him to them. So who is that other? Well, throughout Islamic history, there have been various interpretations. The most famous today is that it was Judas Iscariot. Today, common among Muslims, is that Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, as part of Allah's punishment upon him, was transformed to look identical to Jesus. When you saw him, you thought you looked, you were looking at Jesus. Looked exactly like Jesus. You couldn't tell him apart. So they took Judas away, thinking of Jesus, and they killed him justly. Whereas the real Jesus was taken to heaven by two angels, escorted by two angels. At least the tradition says one angel. Now, the reason why I say two angels is because the Islamic tradition says Jesus will return physically. He will. It is part and parcel of Islamic eschatology because Islam also has a view of end times similar to Christians. Like Christians, the Sunnis and the Shia believe there will be an antichrist. He will arise and that antichrist will be killed by Jesus. So Jesus will return physically. He will descend physically. But in Islamic tradition, he's ascending upon two angels who bring him down to the earth. And by his appearance, he will kill the Antichrist. So it's not just Christians. Now, I know there are some Christians who may not accept this view of eschatology. But historically, and the majority today, it doesn't mean it's right, but I believe it's biblical. Do believe an Antichrist will arise. And he will try to unify people and have people worship him instead of Jesus. That's also an Islamic tradition. I don't know if Jody knew this. Um, I don't know if you knew that, Scott. But in Islamic tradition, the Antichrist is one eye. One of his eyes are damaged. And he has written on his forehead the word <clears throat> disbeliever, kafir. And he will demand people to worship him as God. Right? Al-Dajjal, right? Al-Dajjal. Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal. And he will demand people to worship him as God. And he'll do miracles such as killing someone and resurrecting him back to life in order to convince you that he is God who has power over life and death. 
And so many will follow him, but the Muslims will know not to follow him. And obviously we Christians. And then Messiah comes down to kill him. Now, he was taken physically to heaven. This lookalike was then killed in his place. Now, I said that's the most popular interpretation today. However, one of the oldest interpretations, and you can find this in one of the greatest medieval Muslim commentators on the Quran, whose Arabic commentary on the Quran has been translated in an abridged form. It's called Tafsir ibn Kathir. T-A-F-S-I-R, T-A-F-S-I-R, Tafsir ibn Kathir. And when you read his exposition of chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran, and chapter 4, verse 157, 158. And you'll find this, by the way, free of charge online on alim.org. We don't need to open it up, but just for you guys, if you're taking notes, alim.org, A-L-I-A-L-I-M, A-L-I-M. I have a hard time in English. Now I got to even remember Arabic. Alam.org. You'll read, and he ascribes this interpretation to Ibn Abbas. Now, for those of you who don't know much about Islam, Ibn Abbas was Muhammad's first cousin. And he was one of the first Muslims, considered one of the greatest, most knowledgeable Muslims when it comes to the Quran's interpretation. In this tradition, it says, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus asked the disciples... Some say there were 17, 19. Some say there were 13. However, the numbers vary. They're, they're contradictory numbers. But the numbering is not important. <clears throat> Jesus says to his disciples or asks, he says, which one of you will accept looking like me, being transformed to look like me, to die in my place? Whoever agrees, I guarantee in paradise. So it says the youngest one, the youngest of the disciples said, Ya Isa, Ruh, Ruh Allah, Spirit of Allah, I volunteer. And it says that Jesus asked two more times and that youngest disciple on all three times that Jesus asked said, I volunteer to look like you and be killed in your place so that I can be given paradise, Jannah. So Jesus, so be it. So it says that disciple was miraculously transformed. He looked identically to Jesus. You couldn't tell him apart. Then Jesus ascended with an angel through a hole in the roof, went to paradise. As they came in, they saw that young disciple who now looked exactly like Jesus, and he was killed on the cross. So instead of Jesus dying in your place to save you, Jesus' disciple died in Jesus' place to save him. So Islam has what we call substitutionary sacrifice, but of the most perverted kind. It's not that Jesus died in my place so I can be spared from dying. It's a disciple died in Jesus' place to spare him from dying. So this is one of the oldest interpretations. Not the most popular, but it's one of the oldest. So this is what Islam believes. And because he was taken physically, he will then descend physically, bodily, near the end. He will kill the Antichrist. But then, again, let me, let's finish the point. He will kill the Antichrist. Then he will live as a Muslim ruler. The sound narrations attributed to Muhammad. And this is also in the Shia tradition. He will rule the world as a Muslim ruler and judge. And he will demand everyone converts to Islam. He will destroy all crosses. He will kill all swine. And then he'll remove jizya. Now, what is jizya? Brother, if you can open up chapter 9, verse 29 for us. And read that for us. Nine twenty-nine. Fight against such of those who have been given the scripture as believe not in Allah nor the last day, and forbid not that which Allah hath forbidden by his messenger, and follow not the religion of truth until they pay the tribute readily, being brought low. Okay, so notice, when you fight the people of the book, that's the Jews and Christians, there's a mandatory <clears throat> injunction. It's mandatory. It's a command. It's not abrogated. And it wasn't just for a moment's time. To fight the Jews and Christians until they become Muslim or they want to retain their religious identity, pay tribute. Now, the word tribute is jizya. And jizya 
is a sum of money that Jews and Christians are allowed to pay as a sign of their humiliating defeat, degradation, and subjugation, right? So that they can live as second, if not third-class citizens under Islamic rule, and then submit to Islamic <clears throat> order, do's and don'ts, what they can and cannot do. According to the tradition, when Jesus returns, he will abolish jizya. This payment will be abolished. Why? Because there'll be no unbelievers to take it from. Because Jesus will usher in Islam universally. Everyone must become Muslim or they'll be killed. So if everyone's Muslim, you don't pay jizya anymore because there's no non-Muslims to take it from. Now, if you're wondering why Jesus would kill all swine and destroy all crosses, that's an indictment against Christianity. It's condemning Christianity. How? By destroying all crosses, he is hitting at the heart of the Christian faith. Because the Christian faith is that Jesus died on the cross a shameful, humiliating, brutal death for our sins. And by destroying the cross, it's a way of Jesus insulting Christians. Shame on you, you perverts, for perverting the life of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. He didn't die for you in order to atone for your sins. What blasphemy? So then why does he kill all the swine? Well, that's also an indictment against Christianity, an attack on Christians. Because in the name of Jesus, you have Gentiles who are not ethnically Jewish who say, Jesus gave us the license to eat any meat that we so choose because we're no longer under the dietary prohibitions of the Torah, the Mosaic law. By killing the swine, this is Jesus' way of saying, you liars, you lied in my name. I never gave you the license to eat what you want. So part and parcel of the Islamic faith is not simply an aff affirmation of a Jesus, that's not the real Jesus, but a satanic counterfeit that Paul warned against, but it's part and parcel of the DNA, spiritual DNA of this religion to attack Christian doctrines and degrade Christianity and humiliate Christians. Now, if, it, if that's not proof of the satanic origin of Islam, I don't know what is. So that, in a nutshell, is what the Quran and Islamic sources teach about all of the Quran and the view of the biblical prophets, including the view of Jesus and what Muslims are commanded to believe and affirm and how their attitude should be towards Christians. Now, remember what I said earlier. Most Muslims are very loving, peaceful, and I'm not saying this to be politically correct. This is an honest observation. Because most Muslims don't know their religion. Most Muslims don't know the Quran. Most Muslims don't know the Hadith. Right, so because they do not know their religion, <clears throat> they really don't understand <clears throat> what the religion teaches about Christianity, even though it's a perverted, deceiving, <clears throat> misleading assessment of Christianity. Because in the Quran, Christians are accused of worshiping three gods, Allah being the third of the three, and the other two being Jesus and Mary, which no Orthodox, when I say Orthodox, lowercase o, no true historic Christian group has ever affirmed before, during, or after Muhammad. The only group that would come close in affirming Mary as a goddess would be the Mormons, but they didn't exist at the time of Muhammad. And they're not Orthodox, they're heterodox. They're not a true Christian sect. They're polytheistic. Even their view of God, the Father is a man who became God, and we can all become gods if we follow their system, their satanic system. So the whole point is the Quran also misrepresents and misinforms Muslims about what Christians have believed concerning God, Jesus, and Mary. Now, why is that? Is that, what, is that something deliberate on the part of Muhammad or the author of the Quran? Or was the author of the Quran or authors of the Quran, if it wasn't Muhammad, so ignorant of what Christians believe that he, she, or them misunderstood misinterpreted their beliefs. Whatever the case, this is what many Muslims think. If they have any idea of the Quran and they haven't studied the Bible to great depth, they assume, oh, Christians are those who believe in three gods. Allah is the third of three. Mary is a goddess. Jesus is a god alongside them. And therefore, they are idolaters. So this is a nutshell what Islam teaches. And as far as the books are concerned, what books 
does the Quran recognize as being sent down to the Jews and Christians? Well, the Quran mentions several. It mentions the Zabur, the Psalms of David. In fact, brother, if you can, well, I'll read. I'll read chapter 4, verse 163, 164. If you can, bring up for us chapter 17, verse 55, if you can. Chapter okay. 17, verse 55 of the Quran. I'm going to read chapter 4, verses 163 to 164. Okay, now notice, it's going to mention the Zabur. The Zabur is the Arabic term for the Psalms. Because in Hebrew, it's called Mizmor. So Zabur is the Arabic cognate of Mizmor, right? If you want to know what the word for Psalm is in Hebrew, it's Mizmor, right? And if you want to know what the word for song is, it's Shir, like Song of Psalms. It's Shir Hasharim, Sharim, plural of Shir. Now, let me read to you what it says about the Psalms or the Zabur in chapter 4, verse 163, but I'll also read 164. Lo, we inspire thee, speaking to Muhammad, we've inspired you, we've revealed to you, as we inspired Noah, Noah, and the prophets after him, as we inspired Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac. Now notice even Ishmael is inspired to be a prophet messenger, according to the Quran. And Jacob and the tribes, as we inspire Jesus and Job and Jonah and Aaron and Solomon, and as we imparted unto David the Psalms. Notice all these figures are biblical characters. Everyone mentioned as being inspired by the God of Islam, are biblical characters, right? They're all mentioned in the Bible. And here we're told Dawood, David, was given the Zabur, the Psalms. Then 4164, and messengers we have mentioned unto thee before, and messengers we have not mentioned unto thee. Meaning, there are some messengers we didn't mention their names. And Allah spake directly unto Moses. So what does that mean? It means that Muslims must believe in all the biblical prophets, even those not mentioned in the Quran. Because here the Quran says, there are messengers we didn't give you mention their names, but you have no right to reject them just because they're not mentioned. Now, what does 1755 say, brother? And thy Lord is best aware of all who are in the heavens and the earth, and we preferred some of the prophets above others. And unto David, we gave the Psalms. There you go. Now, uh, final verse to show what are the books that came before the Quran. I'll read chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 3, but I'll include verse 4. Chapter 3, verse 3, but I'll include verse 4. He hath revealed unto thee, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. But it's in 3 where we're told the names of these scriptures. He hath revealed unto thee, Muhammad, the scripture with truth, confirming that which was revealed before it, even as he revealed the Torah. Now, Arabic, it's Torah. Torah and gospel. Arabic, Injil. Before this time, after time, for guidance to mankind, and he hath revealed the criterion, right or wrong, Al-Furqan, lo, those who disbelieve the revelation of Allah, theirs will be a heavy doom. Allah's mighty, able to requite. Now, so there you go. Torah, gospel. Psalms, and then it makes allusions to the pages of Ibrahim, Abraham. Supposedly, Abraham also was given some suhuf, right? Suhuf, pages. Okay, whatever that is. The whole point is, realize this is an aping of the Bible. Realize this is a satanic counterfeit of the Bible. And in interestingly, we're not going to look at it, but if you read chapter 6 of the Quran, write these down, folks. Chapter 6, verses 154 to 157. Chapter 6, verses 154 to 157. And chapter 46 of the Quran, verse 12 and 30. 46, verse 12 and 30. The Quran is supposedly an Arabic version of the book given to Moses. In other words, the Quran claims to be nothing more than an Arabic version of the book given to Moses, including some information and details centering around the life of Muhammad. So the Quran claims not to contradict the Bible, but to confirm it in Arabic and to be an Arabic version of the Bible, but it's anything but an Arabic version, confirmation of the Bible. It contradicts the core teachings of the Bible. But that's what the Quran claims. So if you don't see Satan's fingerprints and mastermind, that Satan inspired Muhammad to produce a counterfeit Bible, to introduce a comfort, counterfeit God and a counterfeit Jesus and a counterfeit Abraham, then you are really missing the boat. So this is what Islam was created to do. Supplant the true word of God, the Bible, 
and the true Jesus of history and the true biblical figures in the hearts of the Arabs and anyone who would be <clears throat> deceived into embracing this religion <clears throat> and to thinking this is the religion of the true prophets and all of the Quran is the true God and the Jesus of the Quran is the Jesus of history who is not God in the flesh, who is not the divine son of God, a mighty messenger, a miracle worker, Allah's word, but still a human servant, no more, no less, even though that's a contradiction in itself. So this is a brief rundown of what Muslims believe. And to finish the point I was making about Jesus, he will rule as a Muslim ruler, but for only 40 years. In authentic traditions attributed to Muhammad, it's not found in the Quran, by the way. So for you Christians, especially Protestant evangelicals who <clears throat> follow scriptures solely, Muslims, unless they are what we call Qurani, there is a group that's on the rise, similar to what we find in Protestantism. And I don't say this denigratingly. What I'm saying is Islam's history follows a similar traje uh, trajectory to that of Judaism and Christianity. It's like what happened to the Jews and Christians happening to the Muslims. And what do I mean? There's now a growing movement among Muslims who follow the Quran alone. They're known as Qur'ani or Quran-only Muslims because they're embarrassed by the Sunnah, the Hadith, the narrations, reports attributed to Muhammad. But the majority of Muslims, even the Shia, do not follow only the Quran. They follow, well, that's why they're called Sunni Muslims, by the way. The largest group of Muslims are called Sunni. Why? Because they follow the Sunnah. Sunnah means the path trodden out by Muhammad. That sunnah found partially in the Quran, but the great bulk of it is not found in the Quran. It's found in these secondary sources, which for the Sunnis are primary, called hadith, a hadith, narrations, reports, also found in the sirah, the biography of Muhammad. So this information about Jesus comes from the sunnah, which is found in the hadith collections, or even found in the sirah, sirah, means the life, the life of Muhammad, or the hadiths, or ahadith, these reports that were collected centuries after Muhammad's reported death, the most famous of which is Sahih bukhari Most Christians working Muslims already know that terminology. And here we are told that when Jesus comes, he'll only live for 40 years. During that time, he'll rule as a Muslim ruler. During that time, he's going to get married to a Muslim woman. During that time, he's going to have children, at least two sons, and he's going to name them Moses and Muhammad after the prophets. He will then die, and he'll be buried next to Muhammad, where Muhammad is buried in Medina, in Arabia, where his grave is. That's what Muslims think. And then on the day of judgment, Yom al Qiyamah, when Allah resurrects the dead, Jesus and Muhammad will be raised physically side by side and then go before Allah. That's what Muslims believe. Sunni Muslims and the Shia also share similar convictions. So I hope that was a real quick, I know when I say quick, but I hope it was clear. But now we can talk about other salient points like women in Islam. But everything clear for you, Jody and uh, Scott? Yeah. Yes, that, that's that's good. Okay, excellent. Now, I did, I did, I did have a couple things um, to bring up here. And um, um, one of the, uh, in the chat, when you were talking about... Um, the name of Allah, one of the um, viewers wrote this, servant of Jesus says, I use Rab or Al-Illah for God in Arabic, not Allah, even though the translation says Allah. So when he's reading to his Muslim friends, I assume, or just instead of saying Allah, so he doesn't have to use the, the title they use, uh, the name they use, he can say Rab or yeah. uh, Al-Illah. Rab, Lord. Rab yeah. would be the Greek equivalent. It would be the Arabic equivalent of the Greek word Kyrios or Kurios, Hebrew Adonai or Adon, right? So Rab, right. for those of you who don't know Arabic, Rab is the Arabic word for Lord, Sovereign, Master. Now, oh. Go ahead. it corresponds to the Hebrew Adonai, which is the name for God, or Adon, or Adoni, or Adoni, Adon, basically. And in Greek, it's Kyrios or Kurios. Just wanted people to know. But you wanted to say something else. But... Yes. Um, I'm reminded by this discussion about uh, the name of God in Arabic. You said in the modern Bibles, the Arabic speakers use the name Allah for God as a generic for God. Uh, we recently 
uh, saw a message given by Tony Costa, and he's, he was talking about how the Christians back in history did not use a law. They used al-illa. Yeah, so, no, yeah, that's partially correct, but that's not entirely correct. Uh, I just got a book, I'll show it to you, by the president of the Evangelical Seminary in Jordan. He wrote a massive tome. Let me find it. Well, I don't know if, I, if it's up here. If it's up here, it should be here. Let me see. Yeah, I know that they said al ila Now, let me, before I show you the book, let me explain for those who don't know too much about Islam. What's al ila What's Allah? And, and in fact, I didn't say Allah as a generic noun, but it can be used generically. Now, I'll explain the difference. al ila the Arabic word al, A-L, is the definite article. In Hebrew, it'd be ha. Or in Greek would be o or ho, if you want to have the breathing accent, right? So, for example, in Hebrew, you could say Elohim or you can say ha Elohim. You can say il or you can say ha il, right? In Greek, you can say theos or you can say o theos. I'm trying to pronounce it like a modern Greek, but, you know, in the Rasmian way, it's theos or ha theos. Well, the word for God, generically, in a generic sense, is ilah, I-L-A-H, ilah. When you want to make it definite, you would say el ilah. <clears throat> so ilah <clears throat> means deity, God or a God. <clears throat> if you want to make it definite, you say el ilah. It's even found in the saying of the Muslim shahada, the testimony, because to be a Muslim in Sunni tradition, you'd have to go in front of two Muslims and say la ilah. Okay, no ilah illallah, except Allah. Now notice, the la means negation, no. Ilah is the word for deity. There is no deity except Allah. Allah is the only ilah. So right there it tells you Allah and ilah are not the same, meaning that Allah is an ilah, he's a deity, but not every ilah deity is necessarily Allah. I don't mean to confuse you, but I hope you get the idea. For example, you could say Zeus is an ilah, but he wouldn't be Allah. Because in Islamic theology, this is where I need the Christians to follow with me. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. Allah becomes the name of the God of Abraham. Like Y-H-W-H, the disciples of Y-H-W-H. Yahweh or Yahovah, I don't pronounce it, I don't care. That's the name of the God of Israel. Elohim is used for many gods in the Hebrew Bible. So you can have Dagon, Dagon as an Elohim, but he's not Yahweh. So Yahweh, Yahovah is Elohim, but not everyone called Elohim is Yahweh, Yahovah. Similarly, Zeus can be an Elah, a god, but he's not Allah of the Quran because in Islamic theology, Allah becomes the equivalent of Yahweh, becomes the deity's identity, his name. Now, the question is, prior to Islam, is that how Allah was used? Was Allah used as a unique name for a unique God? Well, if you look at the evidence, and it's very scanty. What do I mean by scanty? Most of our sources about Islam come from Muslims. And their writings, which are over 100 to 200 years, removed from the time of Muhammad's reported death. But there are indications that Allah was used across the board by various groups for their chief god. So though it was used for the chief god, they didn't have the same god in mind. For example, there is strong evidence, and I may come back and do a session on this if you're interested. That's up to you guys. I've done it on my channel. That the Allah of the pagans, if we rely on the Muslim sources, which are far removed from the time of Muhammad, if Muhammad lived at that time, a lot of assumptions. But anyway, Allah of the pagans in Arabia was actually Hubble, Hubal, the moon god. And Hubble, according to the Muslim sources, was actually the god Baal. The god Baal. The idol of Baal was imported by Amr. Um, uh, this is, again, by the way, the Muslim sources. I'm not making up. The Muslim sources say that Amr ibn Luhay imported the idol of the Moabites. He was in Syria. 
And the Moabites gave them, gave him their idol, the idol of their chief god, and he brought it back to Mecca. This is long before Muhammad's birth. Well, the Moabites worship Baal. We know the Moabites are, the Ammonites, the sons of Lot, and they lived in Syria and Jordan, right, in that area. Well, according to Muslim sources, this idol of Hubal or Hubal, H-U-B-A-L, was imported from the Moabites by Amr when he was visiting Syria, and then he planted it at the Kaaba, and then before Muhammad, this is before Muhammad's time, according to the Muslim sources, Ibn Kathir, I'm not making it up. I got the sources in, on my computer as PDF files. According to them, Hubble became the chief god of Mecca, the lord of Mecca, and the god of the Kaaba, and the Kaaba was a shrine. Well, if you know anything about paganism, you know that when shrines are built, though the, the worshipers worship a plethora of gods, they don't build a shrine for multiple gods. They build a shrine for one chief god. It's just, I mean, they may build another shrine for another god elsewhere. But when they're building a shrine, that particular shrine is devoted to a particular deity without denying that other gods exist, without <clears throat> implying that they didn't venerate other gods, but this was the, the shrine of this particular deity. So the Muslim sources say that the Kaaba was the shrine of Hubble. Hubble was the god of the Kaaba, the lord of Mecca, the god of Mecca, and that Muhammad's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, would worship Hubble as his chief god. And when he'd pray to Allah, he would go before the statue of Hubble and pray to Allah. And Hubble, the planet symbolizing Hubble was the moon. Therefore, if Allah was the god of Mecca and Allah was the god of the Kaaba, and the Muslim sources say Hubble was the god of Mecca and Hubble was the god of the Kaaba, that means Allah was another name for Hubble. Hubble was Allah, Allah was Hubble. So the proper name of Allah was Hubble, and Allah is being used not so much as a proper name, but as the name of this particular deity. Now, in, with that said, we actually have sources, both Islamic and non-Muslims, where we find the word Allah used by Arabic-speaking Christians. Allah, not al ilah So we do have evidence. The Quran itself furnishes evidence, but then some people say, well, that's the Quran. Who cares? Well, all right, that's fine. But do we do have documents. And in fact, the book I was just reading, he was mentioning an Arabic manuscript of the 8th century that shows no Islamic influence produced by Christians, where they're using the word Allah for the God of the Bible without hesitation. So if you ask me, Allah becomes the peculiar name of the God of Islam. It becomes a proper name. And for you serious students of the New Testament, same thing with theos. The word theos Greek in Greek, though a generic noun, because of frequent frequency of usage, functions as the name for the Father, which is why the predominant usage of theos in New Testament is for the Father. Right? If you go to the New Testament, the one theos is the Father. And to distinguish the father from the son, the predominant usage of Lord is for Jesus. Jesus is the one who's most often called Lord, and he's even said to be the one Lord, whereas the father is the one who's most often called God, and he's called the one God. So you see that even in the New Testament, you're seeing this phenomenon. What phenomenon? Where a, a word that's generic through frequency of usage takes on the force of a proper name. Like the word God, theos. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God, in who previous times and in various ways spoke to the prophets, has now spoken to us by his son. So notice, God there is assumed to be the name of the Father. For there is one God, the Father. And likewise, the term Lord is more frequently used of Jesus, rarely used of the Father. In fact, if I were to ask you, Scott, or Jody, how many times in the New Testament is the Father called Lord? I don't know. Very rarely, if at all. One place is James 3, 9, depending on which version of the Bible you use. There it says, the Lord and Father. But even that construction sounds kind of weird in our ears, right? The Lord and Father? Because we're used to God and Father? And we're used to Jesus being called Lord? So similarly, Allah, through frequency of usage, ends up becoming the proper name for the Muslim God.
But did it start out that way? No. Now, servant of Jesus is thinking that by appealing to Isaiah 2, 16, 17, he's making his case. No, he's not. Because the point I'm getting at is that if you have sources, both Islamic and non-Islamic sources, where you have Jews and Christians using Allah without confusing their Allah with the Allah of the Quran, then to say that they never used Allah, that's not factually correct. That's based on a misunderstanding. Because to claim that they used Elilah, what's the proof? Give me one manuscript, epigraphic, archaeological, textual evidence that they used Elilah, not Allah. Because that's the assertion, right? Elilah. Okay, where's the evidence? Did you see any? Was any shown? Right? I mean, did you say any, Jody or Scott? Did you no. when you heard the presentation? Any oh, right. no. archaeological no. inscription given or it's... citation given or example given from the seventh century, eighth century that it was Al Ilah, they didn't use Allah. Yeah, I no, I, I can't not that I can remember, but see, this there, is why I was asking you to see if no, um, that would be confirmed or not. No, that's what I'm saying. There is none. And I'm not and I'm not knocking anyone. Look, remember, all of us are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we are being perfected. So there are things that I believe that I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of. If I was aware, I wouldn't, right? If I knew I was wrong, do you think I'm going to repeat error? So this is the proper, uh, this is the process of sanctification. The Holy Spirit, out of his love for the church, out of his love for us, sanctifies us and perfects us. And iron, sharpens iron. You say something, I challenge it. And therefore, Either I sharpen you to make your case stronger or you can see, yeah, you know what? I was wrong. Bad argument. I won't use it. Right. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, we, we should always also go to primary sources whenever we, we can and be able to quote them. So when I put things in my notes, I try to always put the source, the reference, whatever it is. And especially, the pri you know, look for the primary sources because people say things like that all the time. And you go ask the, or you've asked them, you know, show me the proof, show me the source. And if they can't produce it, well, then. You know, that's, know. that's some, not something uh, that I'm going to repeat, nor let should we. Know, brother, that's, uh, let me find that book because he gives actually, he does give actually evidence. And, I, and it's ironic. I just bought it yesterday at the conference, but I have to see. Just one second, brother. Let me get the book. I'll get it for you. All right. You go ahead and get your book. Uh, I saw this uh, comment. Servant of Jesus says, I, I just feel safe for using Al-Illah. When I think of Allah, I directly think of the Muslim God. I understand. I understand that because, you know, that's what we all grew up with hearing. Allah means the God of, of Islam. So just by, uh, you know, uh, repetition and, and by common usage, that's that's what we we take it to mean. So I, I'm the same. I, when I hear that, I think, ooh, yeah, I know that that's their God. But another thing I've noticed, uh, some Muslims I talk to, They'll just say God instead of Allah. I, I think probably because they're talking to a fellow or a Christian, but um, they'll, they'll they'll say God, so I can say God, and they understand their God the way they understand Him, and I understand mine the way I understand. So they, they'll understand that. You see this book right here? Mm -hmm. This is the book I got. I'm trying to because I don't know. I some I got to change my mind. And by the way, I'm on record. I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't believe Allah the Quran is the God of the Bible. I'm on record saying that the evidence shows. The Allah of pre-Islamic Arabia, the Allah of Mecca and Medina was Hubble, Hubal, and that's Baal. And I've actually argued from Muslim sources, I've given my documentation, Islam is modern Baal worship, worship of Baal under another disguise. Because what was the chief competitor to the worship of Yahweh throughout the Old Testament? The worship of Baal. And so Baal hasn't gone anywhere. Baal is still around under a new identity, Allah of the Quran. But that doesn't mean the term Allah itself is unique to the Muslim deity. Just like the brother, servant of Jesus mentioned. He mentioned that the word Baal, a term that was used for this true God, but then because God got so fed up, so fed up with the Israelites worshiping Baal, he said, you know, just so I can remove Baal from your minds and your mouths and hearts, I won't even let you use that term for me anymore. In fact, here, brother, go to Isaiah 54, 5, and I'll read the quotation here. Isaiah 54, 5. You can bring up the word. Yep, that's the book. Highly recommend getting that book. This is a recognized professor and the president of a seminary in Jordan, evangelical professor. 
But if you go to Isaiah 50, 54, 5, you'll see, not only do you see something astonishing, it's plural. It says, your husbands, plural, are your makers, indication of the plurality within unity of the God of the Bible, that he is one in one way, more than one in another way, because it's plural. It's the plural of Asa and the plural of Baal or Baal, right? You'll see it. It's Ase, which is plural of Asa, and it's Baale, plural of Baal. Literally, it says, your husbands are your makers, but the word husband there is Baal. Their God is said to be our Baal, our Baal. Confirm okay. it for me, brother. Yeah, is, isn't Baal just Aramaic for Lord? It's, it's like Rob and, and Kurias and whatnot. Yeah, so the Hebrew word, yes, but that's the point. He's called Baal here. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean he's the Baal right. worship. That's the whole point. So if the true God can be called Baal, right? And it's not only here he's called Baal. There's other places. Without him being the Baal of the Canaanites or the Baal of the Philistines. So you can have Christians who legitimately call God Allah without him being the Allah of the Quran. But then, because the Israelites were so steeped in the worship of Baal, and God was so fed up, he goes, look, just so I can erase him from your minds and your hearts and your tongues, I won't even let you use that word for me again. That's why if you go to Hosea 2, 16 to 17, now the King James captures the wording. Other translations, they translate it. But you'll see there in the King James, it says, you will call me Ishi, you'll no longer call me Baali, Bailey. And both words mean my husband. He goes, from now on, when you refer to me as your husband, you're going to call me Ishi. You won't call me Baali because I want to remove the bales from you. Baalim, Baalim from you. Hosea 2, 16 to 17. Yeah, there it is. You will call me my husband, Ishi, and no longer will you call me my Baal. Yeah. Baali. Baali. Ali. Why? What does he say? For I will remove the names of the balls from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. But notice he goes, you will no longer call me. Meaning up until that point, what were they calling him? Lord, I guess. Either in Aramaic Ali. or Hebrew. Ba'ali. Yeah. Right? And what's the proof they were? We read Isaiah 54, 5. But he's saying... There's a time I won't even let you call me that anymore. Not because it's necessarily inappropriate. It's because you're so steeped and enslaved to Baal. I want to erase him completely from your mind, your tongues and heart. Because even the mention of Baal will entice you to go to the false Baal. Yeah. This, this gets to back to how we use language. And, and it's very confusing. There was a God named El, a Ugaritic God. Exactly. Right? So. El. so that's not the same God as our L, who, uh, you know, God is sometimes called L in the Old Testament, but, uh, and then frequently then it's um, qualified with something else like El Chai, the, uh, the living God, or El, El, uh, El Elyon, the God most high. So these things, uh, God has lots of names and they get confusing. In fact, here, and you know, you're very familiar with liberal critical scholarship. There's an argument that early on, that the Israelites were polytheists because they originate mm -hmm. from Can Canaanites and their religion is Canaanite polytheism, that Yahweh was one of the sons of Eel and only later did their identity be become collapsed into one. Yeah. So scholars argue that and they say there's some archaic evidence for it because in some of the Psalms and <clears throat> some of the traditions of the Pentateuch, you find ancient poems or songs like Deuteronomy 32 or Psalm 82 that survive the pre-exilic polytheistic religion of the Israelites because they tell you that in Deuteronomy 32, 8 to 9, it says when the most high apportioned the nations according to the number of sons of God, God, which is the reading of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says, and Yahweh's portion was Jacob, meaning see, Yahweh is one of the sons of God that the most high gave an inheritance to that's how liberal critical scholars read it okay so what what am i getting at same arguments that some of my christian brothers are using about all of the quran are same arguments liberal scholars are using about the old testament because el or il the canaanites 
And we found evidence at Ugarit tablets, giving us an idea of what the Canaanite religion would have been like. El was the father of the gods. He had 70 sons, 70 sons of Il. And Baal was one of his sons, who was the cloud rider. And this Il was a very grotesque, super exalted human because he had a physical body and he would perform sexual escapades. Very disgusting. These gods were all perverts. They were just a more glorified form of human beings and pretty much did what immoral human beings did on earth. But what's my point? Same kind of reasoning that is being used about all of the Quran is being employed by liberal scholars in regards to Old Testament monotheism, that we don't have monotheism as we know it until Deutero Isaiah, post-exilic Jews. But prior to that, the Jews or the Israelites were a sect of the Canaanites or were influenced by Canaanite mythology. And at one point, they believed Il was distinct from Yahweh, but then they became one. Of course, these are all theories, and the evidence doesn't support it. Similarly, what does our Lord say? Use equal weights and measures. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Don't use one form of argument against Muslims that can be used equally against you. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Now here, in this book, here you go. This is Imad and Shahada, God with us and without us, volumes one and two, the beauty and power of oneness in Trinity versus absolute oneness. He has a section on the word Allah, and it's from page, so you guys can find it. I was just reading it, uh, interestingly. <laughs> Let me get you the exact page number. I'm going to tell you about the manuscript evidence that he found. This is in chapter five, page 91. Is it the same God? Is it the same God? And now notice what he says about these manuscripts. Okay, let me, let me really quickly read through it. So could Allah have been used by Jews and Christians? Well, there's evidence that shows they did use it for the true God. But does that mean Allah the Quran is the Allah worshipped by Jews and Christians? Absolutely not. I don't believe that myself. Now watch here. Here it is. Let me find the first. Let me find the number, so I can read the exact here. Uh, let me find it. Before I move, I just want to find the note. Then bring back die. Sorry, guys. Just uh, because this is not my copy, it's my my friend's copy, and my copy I had it underlined. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. Further evidence for this is page ninety four. Further evidence comes from the oldest extant Arabic manuscript of the New Testament known as Vatican 13. Okay, servant of Jesus, I want you to l listen to this. Dated to the 8th century AD. Okay. It contains most of the synoptic gospels, all of the letters of Paul, and the letter to the Hebrews. Careful comparison of this translation with other translations reveals that it was most likely translated from the Greek New Testament. But what is most obvious is that there is no evidence of Islamic influence on this manuscript, yet it uses Allah throughout. So he's actually giving you archaeological evidence. Manuscript from the 8th century Vatican 13 in Arabic, and there is no Islamic influence, meaning that Muslims somehow influenced the transcribers or had a hand in it. And yet no Islamic influence, and already in 8th century, 700s, they're using Allah for the God of the Bible. We have to go where the evidence leads, not on assumptions, right? And then he mentions another one that does have obvious Islamic influence. The other one is <clears throat> Mount Sinai Arabic Codex 151. He says dated from the 9th to 11th century, but here he says you can see obvious Islamic influence on it. But the oldest extent Arabic copy, dated from the 8th century, Vatican 13, shows no influence of Islamic tampering or <clears throat> suppression or enforcement. And yet these Christian transcribers use Allah throughout. There you go, right there. Is that the same book that we you showed us earlier? Yes, same okay. book. You should get it. It's highly recommended because he is a bona fide scholar. I met him at the conference. A very gentle, scholarly, spiritual giant. Very humble man who's been serving the Lord for over 60 years. And he's the president of the Evangelical Seminary in Jordan. 
Imad Shahada. Worth getting. I'm, and I just start reading it, so I, I expect I'm going to find gold in it. But what's the point? Let's make it clear, not to belabor the point. The point is, just because there's evidence that Christians did use Allah, contrary to what our brother Tony Costa implied. And again, that doesn't mean Tony's being dishonest. No, no, it's, it has nothing to do with dishonesty. It has to do with sometimes certain facts don't reach us or we're unaware of certain facts. But even if the fact is clear, they use Allah, that doesn't mean Allah of the Quran is the Allah of the Bible. The evidence shows no, just like the word El we were talking about, used for a false God, used for the true God. Baal, used for a false God, used for the true God. Even in Greek, when you said Ha Theos, to a Greek pagan, that was Zeus. Jupiter, when you said Ha Pater, to a Greek pagan, that was Zeus. Because Zeus was known as God the Father. He was the father of the gods. In fact, here's what's astonishing for those Christians who don't know this. They're going to be blown away. Acts 17, 28. If you can bring up, brother, Paul quotes two Greek poets, Epimenides and Aratus, and he cites one of them talking about we are all offspring of Zeus. If you go back and find the context of the citation where it says we are all his offspring, that is referring to Zeus being the father of human beings. But Paul took that citation about Zeus and applied it to the father of Jesus. Acts 17, 28. If you can read it for us, brother. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Now you got a note telling you, and you see their quotation marks, right? That means he's quoting a source. And if you go back and find the source, there the pagan poet was talking about Zeus. We humans are the offspring of Zeus. Paul quotes a statement about Zeus and applies it to the true God. Right in this footnote mentions Aratus of Soli uh, is the uh, the Greek um, philosopher who wrote this poem, Phenomena. Yep. So there's the source. And the source will tell you it's there. He's talking about Zeus that we are the offspring of Zeus. Now here's what's ironic: if you actually do an intense study of the polytheistic beliefs of these ancients, you'll find it's the same cluster of gods. It's the same gods, just differently named. So Zeus is Baal, Adonis, Tammuz, right? It, it's basically the same gods, like Zeus is Jupiter in Latin. Well, he, he's ba So it's the same cluster of gods, just the names are different because of the language difference. And sometimes the stories are mutilated, embellished, and slightly different. But if you look at it, they're basically the same cluster of gods. Right? So right. the whole point is, Let's not get so hung up on Allah, whether we should use it or not. I'm on record, and I've documented it, and I'm willing to de debate it with any Muslim scholar. Allah of the pre-Islamic pagans, according to Muslim sources, the Allah of Arabia, of Mecca and Medina, that Allah was Hubble, Hubal. Hubal, Hubble was actually Baal. Hubble, Hubal is the Arabicized form of either he is Baal, who, Baal, who, the pronoun in Hebrew, he, he is Baal, or it can be a corruption of oh. Ha, it can be a corruption of Ha Baal, the Baal. Right, which would mean the Lord, or yeah. Lord with a capital L, we would say. So it's not other than modern Baal worship. That's all it is. Islam is male worship. So it's not, all of the Quran is not the God of the Bible, but it doesn't mean you can't use Allah. So I hope we got that out of the way. I don't know, you know, but. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's all very clear. Um, I was just thinking, um, perhaps as the next step, let's talk about how to use this information or the information that we have to witness to Muslims, because as you were saying, they're not familiar with their own uh, sources, they're not familiar with the Quran and the Hadith, which is shocking when you start talking to them. But um, I, I remember one apologist who was working with Mormons said, Sometimes you have to teach the Mormons their own theology, their own doctrine that's taught by their, their church before you can, you know, witness to them uh, effectively. So I think it's this, sort of the same way with Muslims. You kind of need to expose them to what the Quran and the sources say. And I wanted to get, you know, you get your advice um, on, on how to witness them with this. It's exact same advice that 
that brother gave about Mormons, most Muslims are so uneducated about Islam that at times you are forced to then teach them their own religion, sadly. But now, how would I go about bringing a Muslim who is not hostile, who's not antagonistic, who's not blasphemous, who's not demonized and doesn't care about truth, he just wants to mock and ridicule and blaspheme, that person that you don't waste your time with. There's nothing you can do for that person. So you need discernment, don't waste. But that Muslim who doesn't know and is really engaging you in a loving manner and is interested. Notice what Paul did. Did Paul ever correct the citation? When he's quoting a citation that's about Zeus, did he stop and say, well, Zeus is not the God I'm proclaiming? No, because why? In the context, they were referring to an unknown God. And so he says, right. this unknown God, he is the one who's our father. We are truly his offspring. So in saying that, he already demonstrated the God he's proclaiming is not Zeus, though he quoted a passage about Zeus. You see how he did it? Mm -hmm. With the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Because Zeus was not unknown. They knew who Zeus was. But he says, hey, you got an altar to an unknown God, meaning that you're aware there may be a God out there and you don't want to anger him because a lot of people don't know that in pagan cultures, it was vitally important that you appease the gods and goddesses with sacrifices as a form of bribes, lest they get angry and fight against you. So they try to cover all bases. Maybe there's a God we're missing, so we don't want him to get angry. So we're going to offer a sacrifice in case he's there. Hey, you know, if you're there here, we appease you. Please don't be angry with us. Because that's what they thought. He goes, well, hell, let me tell you about that unknown God. We are his offspring. And it's in him we move and live and have our being. Well, right there, he just did two things. That one he showed, Zeus is not your father. We are not his offspring. Even though he just quoted something about Zeus, right? The one who's your father is the unknown God that now I'm going to reveal to you. So right, right there, without saying it, he just showed Zeus is not the father of humanity. We're not his sons. But he did in such a way where he didn't have to come out and say, hey, Zeus is a false god. You caught it, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You see the spirit filling these inspired emissaries to speak in such a way that if we're not paying attention, we're going to miss it. Because he just refuted Zeus is our father, we are sons. How? Because he's talking about the unknown God. Well, they knew Zeus. So then someone could say, but wait, the quotation you cited is about Zeus. Yes, but I'm letting you know that you're the offspring of this God whom now I'm making known to you. And this God is the one who revealed himself in the man that he raised from the dead, Jesus of Nazareth. So my point is, we can also then use the Quran and quote aspects of the Quran that agree with the Bible. For example, when it says Jesus is the Messiah, well, Ace of the Quran is not the real Jesus, right? So uh, that's a given. But do I have mm -hmm. to start a conversation by saying, hey, your Isa is a satanic counterfeit? Or can I say, hey, that Asa, whom you say is the son of Miriam, the virgin born son of Miriam, who's the Messiah? Now, let me tell you what Messiah means. Because the Quran says he's a Messiah, but do you know what that means? Right. No, I have no clue. It's not, okay. Do you know what it means for him to be born of a virgin? Why the virgin? No, I have no clue. Why is Miriam, his mother, the greatest woman that Allah created? Do you know what? No. See, then you don't start by saying your Isa is a satanic counterfeit. The medium of the Quran is a satanic counterfeit. Since they assume it's one and the same, use that to bring them to the Jesus of the New Testament. And as they read, they will discover, hold on. Man, this Jesus of the New Testament who's the Jesus of history. It's completely different to the East of the Quran. The East of the Quran can't be re the real deal. So as they mature in the faith, they will make that connection for themselves. Right? Right. So this is my method to those who sincerely are looking and asking Right? Yeah. Use the Quran as a stepping stone, like Paul, Paul used. Now, what's amazing about Acts 17, if you guys want the paradigm, if you guys want the paradigm of how to do effective evangelism in the power of the Holy Spirit, don't look any further than the book of Acts. The book of Acts is an accurate history, Luke wrote, of the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles in building the church. Here's what's astonishing about Paul's methodology. In Acts 17, when you read verses 1 of 4, it says, when he would find a local gathering of Jews, as was his custom, he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath and reason with them from the scriptures, 
that the Messiah had to suffer and be raised on the dead and then prove Jesus is the Messiah. That's Acts 17, verse 1 to 4. Notice with the Jews, he's using the scriptures. But then starting in that same chapter in 16 to 32, dealing with the Greeks at Oropagus, Mars Hill, not once does he quote the Old Testament. Catch his motive? Because he understands mm -hmm. the Old Testament is not authoritative for them. So if I said, well, Moses wrote, they'll say, well, who cares what Moses wrote? And? But what did he quote? Their sources of authority. He's presupposing the biblical worldview, the one God who made all people from one blood, scattered us all throughout the world for one purpose, to know who he is, because he's not far from us. Well, he's presupposing the Old Testament narrative. God created heavens and earth, and we descended from one blood, Adam and his spouse. But he doesn't tell you that he's quoting Genesis. And then he affirms the resurrection of Jesus. But what does he do? He doesn't quote a single Old Testament passage because he knows it has no weight for them. But he quotes those sources that are not inspired, written by pagans, worshiping false gods and goddesses because they contain some truth that he can use to bring them to the fullness of the truth. That's how you're supposed to do evangelism, like they did it. Right. Uh, I, I just I remembered something that I wanted to make a comment on when you were speaking about Quran only Muslims. And I was uh, quoting the passage in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 that says we uh, destroy strongholds. I, you know, I, I always picture Islam as this, this big stronghold and it has all this territory. But as we are, you know, have been attacking as, you know, apologetics and Christians generally as the spirit has, has been moving through these workers, um, the, the, you know, the stronghold is shrinking. It's not, it's crumbling perhaps a little bit. The, the foundation is shaky, but those who have retreated inside uh, to just the Quran have, have given up the outer walls, you know, <laughs> they're, they're yeah. like, all right, we see from all the things that you've, all the objections you've made, all the, the, the horrible things that you've shown us from the, the, the Hadith, the Sunnah, we, we're not going to defend that anymore. Let's retreat. Now we're Quran only. Now it's time, you know, to continue the attack on, on those people at the Quran and say, show them the contradictions in the Quran, show them how it, you know, uh, affirms the Bible and that contradicts itself. All those things would seem to me like, you know, that's the, that's the place to attack uh, with those people. Of course, the others are still defending Hadith. Yeah, because without the Hadith, you can't make heads or tails out of the Quran. Now, the beauty about the Bible, even those who don't affirm Sola Scriptura would affirm what they call Prima Scriptura. The Bible is inspired in such a way that you're given the historical information for the most part, to make sense out of the narratives and the teaching, right? I don't need to go outside of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John to know where Jesus ministered, where he was born, where he was raised, and where he ministered, right? I don't need to go outside of Exodus to know where the Exodus took place. In other words, the Bible is inspired in such a way that it gives you the historical details to make sense out of the teachings, the moral teachings, the spiritual instruction. Not so with the Quran. In fact, if I challenge the Quran only Muslim, and this is how I destroy their position. And I have a link, which I'll share with you on a series of articles, verses 2.2, questions to ask to show the Quran only Muslims are desperate and they're going to have to appeal to outside sources because the Quran is incomplete, incoherent, unintelligible. For instance, if you ask the Muslims, <clears throat> where was Jesus born? No clue. Where did Jesus minister? No clue. When Mary received the Annunciation that she was to conceive the Messiah, where? No clue. Who's Adam's wife? What's her name? No clue. What are the names of Adam's sons? No clue. It mentions the sons of Adam, but it doesn't give mm -hmm. them their names. It's in chapter 5 of the Quran, 27 to 32, their story that one murdered the other. Who murdered who? No clue. <clears throat> How many wives did Abraham have? No clue. Did Ishmael and Isaac have the same mother or did they have two different mothers? No clue. Was Hagar the mother of Ishmael and Sarah the mother of Isaac? No clue. In fact, is Ishmael the father of Isaac as Isaac's the father of Jacob? Or is Ishmael the brother of Isaac? And if so, does that mean Isaac is the brother of Jacob? What do I mean? You'll find formulaic expressions in the Quran where it says, Allah gave to Abraham Ishmael and Isaac. But then it says, Allah gave to Abraham Isaac and Jacob. Same formula. Now, I'm confused. When it says, Allah gave to Abraham Isaac and Jacob, that's a son and grandson, not two brothers. But then it says, Allah gave to Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. Should we assume, 
assume the same pattern, son and grandson, or two brothers? How do I know? How do I know whether Ishmael is the father of Isaac, like Isaac is the father of Jacob, or Ishmael is the brother of Isaac, which means Isaac is the brother of Jacob? How do you answer these questions from the Quran alone? You can't. But let's take it even more recently. Where was the Quran composed? No clue. Quran doesn't tell you. What year was the Quran composed? We don't know. How many chapters make up the Quran? Quran doesn't tell you. How many verses in each chapter? Quran doesn't tell you. What about the ordering of the Quran? Where did that come from? Quran doesn't tell you. Now, that's just general questions. Now, if I go more specific, chapter 111 of the Quran, it's called Surah al lahab Read it for us, brother. It's a short surah. Chapter 111. Okay, 111. Al Lahab. Al or Abu Lahab as well. It's both. All right. The, the power of Abu Lahab will perish and he will perish. His wealth and gains will not exempt him. He will be plunged in flaming fire, and his wife, the wood carrier, will have upon her neck a halter of palm fiber. That's it. That's it. Does it? What the heck is this all about? Who is Abu Lahab? Why is he being punished? What did his wife do that she's going to be carrying wood in the fire? Nobody knows. Without, without some external sources. Of course. But wait. Quran only Muslims. They say that all you need is a Quran. No, you don't. Because you can't answer any of the questions I just asked you from the Quran alone. Prove it. Show me who this Abu Lahab is. Why... Is he mentioned in the Quran? What sin did he commit that he gets special mention? Look at 33 verse 37 for me. I'm going to give you a couple examples. 33 verse 37. 33. 37. Let me put that up on the screen so everybody can watch. And when thou said unto him, on whom Allah has conferred favor, and thou has conferred favor, keep thy wife to thyself, and fear Allah, and thou didst hide in thy mind that which Allah was to bring to light, and thou didst fear mankind, whereas Allah hath a better right than thou, that thou should fear him. So when Zaid had performed that necessary formality of divorce from her, we gave her unto thee in marriage, so that henceforth there may be no sin for believers in respect of wives of their adoptive sons, when the latter have performed the necessary formality of release from them, the commandment of Allah must be fulfilled. Who's Zayd? You wouldn't know without external sources. What is this talk about Zayd wanting to divorce his wife and this person kept it hidden what Allah was going to reveal? They, they can't know. And then when it says, when thou said, who's thou? Who, who's thou? When you said unto whom Allah conferred favor, who's you when you said? I don't know. And how does this divorce and then the person being addressed, marrying Zayed's divorced wife, set a precedence for other people to marry the divorced wives of their adopted sons? What's the connection? Can't know without something external. Yeah, but remember, Quran only Muslims can appeal to external sources without refuting their argument. It's a self-refuting argument, right? Yeah, I mean, what what do they say? Do they have some other? Um, they they form? appeal to outside sources. Right, right. There, then, there's the Azbab al Nazul, the the settings of the Quran that tells you what it means, but precisely. those are taken from Quran and. It Sarah. is so easy to destroy Sahana. this religion. It's the most irrational, inconsistent right. religion that I've encountered. Maybe there are others. But from my experience, and the real miracle to me is that people actually think this religion, this book is miraculous. Let me give you two more examples. Just two. Go to chapter 17, verse 1 of the Quran. Chapter 17, verse 1. Um, all right, that's 11. 17, verse 1. Glorified be he who carried his servant by night from the inviolable place of worship to the far distant place of worship, the neighborhood whereof we have blessed, that we might show him of our tokens. Lo, he, only he, is the hearer, the seer. Who's speaking to who, and who is the servant that he took by night 
from which mosque to what mosque and when? This one doesn't even say mosque. It says place of worship. Yeah, exactly. Place of worship, which is Masjid. No, it's, al it's, it's Masjid. Yeah, Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. But okay. Oh. Okay, it says glorified be he. Who's saying glorified be he? Who's speaking? And who's the servant? And what inviolable place of worship was he taken from? And distant place of worship, distant from where? Right. And then it gets confusing so that we may show him our signs. Now notice, the pe person speaking is, is plural, so that we might show him our signs. Now notice who the him is. It's supposed to be that servant, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you go back and follow the nearest antecedent to the subsequent pronouns, we might show him our signs, tokens, which means miracles. He, only he is the here and the seer. So they're going to show the one who sees and hears their miracles? <laughs> yeah, it's incoherent. And when did it happen? No clue. Final one. This one is a doozy. The final one. Chapter 30, verses 1 of 4. Uh, Alif Lam Mim. That's how it starts. The Romans have been defeated in the near land, and they, after their defeat, will be victorious. Within 10 years, Allah is, is the command in the former case and in the latter, and in that day, believers will rejoice. Now, it doesn't say within 10 years. It says few years, but that's okay. It says few years, but we'll, we'll go with that because they'll say, the commenters say it means three to nine years. That's all right. Now, my question to you would be, it says the Romans have been defeated. Who defeated them? Don't know. In a land nearby. Land nearby where? Don't know. And then it says a few years, within 10 years, they will be victorious. 10 years from what date? Because we want to know the date so we can then see if it happened, right? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, tell me about it. And there are people that murder for this religion, kidnap women for this religion, rape women for this religion, a religion that is so obviously false that the real miracle is that people actually think this is a miracle. There you go. It's a so that's it. Now, it's a yeah, it that might is be a miracle. It might be a miracle people actually believe this stuff. Yeah. Now, brethren, yeah. I did take up about over an hour of your time on this subject. If you guys want me to do a part two on women Islam, now we're ready for it. But it's up to you. Yeah, guys. let's do. Uh, well, how about another day we do part two? That's what I'm saying. Another yeah. day, since instead of making this too long, and then Lord willing, I'll share this with your permission to my channel and get you guys. Uh, I'm trying to get you guys as many subscribers as possible because I really actually, I mean that. You guys are doing great work. You're covering a variety of topics that need to be covered. May the Lord cause you to prosper for his glory and provide for your for your ministries because we need more people doing what you're doing because you're covering a variety of cults, not just Islam. And we need that for the glory of Jesus. Right. And, and not only do we want to talk about the cults, but talk about, you know, why Christianity is the, the, the correct answer, why Jesus is the greatest, as uh, I have a series of uh, uh, talks on, on Jesus as the greatest, what it is that we're going to replace their belief with. You know, if we can destroy someone's uh, false belief system or, or, or reveal to them that they're within a false belief system, we need to, you know, show them the beauty of the true gospel of Jesus Christ so that they have a place to go to when they leave, because a lot of these people... They leave, they become atheists. They be, you know, they, be, they get upset at, uh, you know, authority figures in general at churches or, uh, you know, religious institutions and men who have been teaching them. And they, they just start to reject everything and they're headed down the road of atheism. But we need to show them that, you know, they're, they're not coming to a, 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 ch a church, uh, a building, a, a, an institution of men. We want them to know that they should come to Jesus, come to God, come to faith in, in Christ, not in, in another set of men, in another set of authority figures, in some other institution, uh, institution on earth. Come to, come to Christ. That, so, you know, it's not only to, to tear down those strongholds, but to show them the, the path uh, to, to water, the Sharia, you know, <laughs> and Jesus is that Sharia, the way. From what you're saying, the one of the largest, YouTube channels that has several hundred thousand subscribers up there with David Wood is apostate prophet channel. 
And he's yeah. a former Muslim who became an atheist. Because why? Though Islam was destroyed, he didn't have anything to replace it. Now, good thing is he's very open to Christianity and the Bible, and he's brought people to defend the Bible. Right. So that means his journey isn't over. Only the Lord knows whether his journey right. will bring him to Jesus. And that's our prayer, because without Jesus, he's no better off than Muslims in the afterlife. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't mind uh, having him on this program one day, the apostate prophet. He, he's really awesome. And David Wood, maybe he can be on this program once yep. one day too. No, you can get him on. Just uh, apostate prophet is easy to get a hold of. So David's a little harder, but Lord willing, they'll be on. But keep praying. His journey's not over. And he has a lot of love for Christians and respect for Christianity because he knows that Christianity produces intellectual giants. Because the Holy right. Spirit is alive in us for the glory of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is all wise. Amen. We have a comment. Pray, Ridvan, he opens his heart to Jesus. That's yes. Uh, right. We do. Well, I, right. I have been uh, praying ever since I heard of AP. I've been listening to him. I've been a follower of his for years. Uh, ever since I've heard of him, he's been on my prayer list every day. You know, every at least every week i'm not saying i pray for him every day but i try to pray for ap every day because he, he's such a smart guy but being smart don't mean you're right so um let's let's continue praying for him that he'll come to the knowledge of the lord jesus christ yep and i pray Amen. i encourage people to subscribe your channel and share it and i will be doing my part to serve you guys and getting you more subscribers. I pray Jesus will bless you and prosper you, give you the health you need, the holiness to delight his heart, the provision, and just fill you with his wisdom and love to glorify Jesus Christ until every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Sam, for coming on our show and for all the instruction. Thank you, everyone in the, the chat room for your um, your, your comments and your kindness and your um, you know blessings and all 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 that you do uh, you make the the show worth doing uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be fun without you <laughs> it wouldn't be worth doing without you and if you know you uh, have comments or, or, or questions you can write to us uh, disciples of Yahweh at gmail.com we always spell Yahweh without vowels so it's y h w h that's this, as well as true of our channel name Y-H-W-H. And uh, just, you know, uh, thank you for your prayers as well. We know uh, that you do pray for us. Uh, we hear, hear you say that. Drop us a line, put a comment in the, in the box, ask a question, and we look forward to seeing you again the next time we go live and keep, keep an eye out for our other videos and, and video series. And thank you, Sam. Thank you, um, Jody, I'm I'm Scott. Uh, Jody is, is my brother. We are the disciples of Yahweh, and this has been the Truth Seekers broadcast. Jody, I'll give you the last word. All right. Just remember uh, to pray for us that we will know the directions, which way God would have us to go. Uh, pray that uh, we'll do his will. And like Sam said, if we, you know, I know if I probably err on some issues in the Bible, but it's not because, you know, it's not because I want to err. I'm yeah. trying to uh, know the Bible 100 percent. So uh, keep us in your prayers. Subscribe to our channel, Disciples of YHWH in Christ. And most of all, pray for us. And